Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Behrouz Qamari Tabrizi. I'm the director of the Sharmin and Bijan Musavar Rahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies here at Princeton University. Um, before we start our uh, Wednesday webinar, uh, let me thank, as always, uh, our events coordinator, Ebeki Parnian, and uh, our technical support, Pete Novak, for all the work and effort they put into this series to make it uh, as accessible and uh, smooth as possible. And also a, uh, a couple of uh, logistical issues. The entire conversation and presentation today would be one hour and, um, and uh, you can uh, submit your questions during the lecture uh, through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen on the right side. Uh, and uh, I will read uh, your questions and pose them to our uh, special guest uh, today. Um, uh, we have the pleasure of hosting Professor Jennifer Jenkins from University of Toronto's uh, History Department, who is a visiting fellow with us uh, this uh, semester and hopefully for longer during the uh, uh, summertime in uh, Princeton. Professor Jenkins is a global historian who writes on Iran from the perspective of international diplomacy and uh, political economy. Uh, an associate professor and Canada research chair in German history at the University of Toronto. She is working on two uh, book manuscripts. The first, The Persian Question, Germany and Iran in the Age of Empire, and German, The German Orient from 1905 to 1979. She has held fellowships from the Jackman Humanities Institute at the University of Toronto, uh, the Canada Research Church Chairs Program, the National Endowment for the Humanities, Harvard University, and Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. She was an associate at the Zentrum Modernen Orient in Berlin uh, and a senior associate member of uh, St. Anthony's College, Oxford University. In December 2019, she was an Eva and Victor Klemperer Fellow at the uh, TU uh, Dresden. The Persian Question uh, Manuscript investigates Iran and Germany in the international system before 1914, exploring Germany's Middle Eastern networks between the Crimean War and the First World War and highlighting the entanglement of uh, German, British, and Russian policies in the region. It specifically analyzes German diplomatic support for the Iranian and Turkish nationalist movements and the changes this brought to international diplomacy and European alliance uh, politics in the lead up to the war in 1914. The German Orient, uh, based upon which uh, the talk, uh, uh, today's talk is, analyzes uh, what was called Germany in Asia as a 20th century political and economic project, which ran through government and civil society connections and took shape in a series of encounters between German institutions and nationalist and anti-colonial intellectuals across the Middle East and South Asia. The German Orient expands the project of global history by foregrounding economic history and European Asian connections, analyzing specifically Germany's 20th century projects of economic expansion and their transnational actors. Uh, Professor Jenkins is the author of Provincial Modernity, Local Culture and Liberal Politics in Fond du Siècle Hamburg, uh, and co-editor of a wonderful collection with uh, uh, Jeff Ely 
on German modernities from Wilhelm to Weimar, which came out in 2016. Uh, and on that, I would uh, uh, ask uh, my friend and colleague, Jennifer Jenkins, to uh, take the floor and uh, she will talk for around 40 minutes and then we'll open up for questions. Welcome, Jennifer. You're on mute. Um, thank you so much, Beirut. And thank you, uh, thank you for the generous introduction, for the invitation to be at the center and uh, for the invitation to present some of my work to all of you here today. And uh, with thanks to everyone who's attending, I will jump right in. I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. I hope everyone can see that. Okay, it seems that I'm not getting any notices that, that you can't see it, so I'm assuming you can. So I'm going to jump we right can, in. We can see it, yes. Very good, okay. So I'm going to start here. This, this is from the New York Times, July 30th, 1941, approximately a month, slightly less, before the British invasion of Iran. This was a, a notice in the New York Times, Germans in Iran, British warning heeded by Tehran. So on the day of the British invasion of Iran, August the 25th, 1941, the British minister in Tehran, Sir Reader Bullard, gave Iran's prime minister, Ali Mansour, a statement declaring that the large numbers of Germans in Iran were the reason for the attack. Bullard defined them as a fifth column and said that they were bent on a Nazi coup d'etat and claimed that the Iranian government had been slow in removing them. Now there were Germans in Iran, Bullard was right about that, but he was wrong on much else. The Iranian government had agreed to remove the Germans but had not proceeded rapidly enough. And the actual number of Germans in Iran in 1941 was a matter of debate. So how many were there? Were there? The British command in India said that there were between 2,000 and 3,000. The former German minister in Tehran, a man named Vipart von Blücher, said there were 2,000. The Iranian newspaper Etalat said that there were only 690. So why were these numbers so elastic? And beyond the numbers, who were these people? What were they doing in Iran? And were they Nazis bent on the Nazification of the country as Bullard claimed? Now I work on the long relationship between Germany and Iran. And the 1930s are certainly a very interesting period in this longer history. The German presence in Iran in the 1930s was larger than at any earlier period. It was more politicized, it was more organized, and it was more powerful than it had been in previous periods. And Iran held a definite place in the Nazi plans for war, at least up to 1941. After the British Soviet invasion, that then changes. But up to 1941, Iran definitely has a definite place in the Nazi plans for war. It's well known that Reza Shah was an admirer of Hitler as were members of his inner circle and members of Iran's political elite more generally. Some of the Iranian students who were in Berlin had also been radicalized by the far right. And there was an official relationship between the two countries. Nazi dignitaries paid state visits to Iran. Iranian politicians went to Germany. The Nazi funded illustrated journal Irani Bastan, which was funded by Yosef Goebbels' propaganda ministry. This journal gave the impression of fascism on the march in Iran. However, a lot of that was smoke and mirrors. National socialism was not a mass movement in Iran. And while the political relationship between the two countries was certainly intense, it was also brittle and it was highly volatile. As I argue, so what is the stable ground? What is the big stable ground for the relationship between Nazi Germany and Reza Shah's Iran in the 1930s, I argue it lays in their state economic involvement. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. This was highly organized, it expanded year to year, and it brought Germany's largest industrial companies into the country with contracts to build industrial infrastructure. 
Now, I want to say here at the outset that in terms of the long relationship between Germany and Iran, of which this section in the 1930s is a portion, one of the constants of this long relationship is the support given by German diplomats and the German Foreign Office to the Iranian nationalist movement. This starts before the First World War, as German diplomats in Iran supported the constitutionalists during the Constitutional Revolution. At that point, that was the roots of the relationship between the two countries, between the German diplomats, the German Foreign Office, the Iranian constitutionalists, that brings the politicians and the intellectuals known as the Kaveh group. That's what brings them to Berlin after 1914. So this, this long relationship between nationalists on both sides, but I say that to then say, of course, nationalism itself is not a constant. The nationalism of the pre-1914 German Foreign Office was not the same as the racialized nationalism of the Nazis, and Reza Shah's nationalism was certainly different from that, the Kaveh group in Berlin during the First World War. The roots of Germany's larger industrial presence in Iran are in this pre-1914 period, at least as ideas, which then begin to be realized in the, late 19, in the late 1920s through the efforts of these men. This here on, on the left, this is Count von der Schulenburg. He is the German minister in Tehran. And here he, he is with court minister Temur Tash. So the efforts of this man working with Schulenburg, working with Temur Tash and others, and here's the Count von der Schulenburg. Here he's one of Germany's most powerful diplomats. We will see him a few times in different guises during the course of this talk. But he is the minister, the German minister in Iran in the Weimar Republic starting in 1923. He, under Schulenburg's uh, sort of expert guidance, he starts opening up the way for German firms to begin receiving large industrial contracts in 1928 after Reza Shah had abolished the capitulations and had opened the national economy to international competition. So after this point, Schulenburg is then working to bring Germany's largest companies into Iran. So this, these are companies like Krupp, AEG, Siemens, Ferrostahl, Hochtief, these and the aircraft company Junkers, as you can see here. So the Junkers aircraft company begins to provide Iran's civil aviation network, including regularly scheduled flights between Iran and Europe. And these planes here, these are actually the Junkers F-13 aircraft. These were, um, I like to think of them as the Teslas of the 1920s. They were made all of, they were all of metal and they were the most modern thing around for small passion, passenger transport. So these are the uh, a group of them arriving in Iran. Now the Frankfurt firm Philipp Holtzmann, which had built the Baghdad Railway before 1914. Philipp Holtzmann, this uh, company is now part of the international consortium that is building the Trans-Iranian Railway. So it's this kind of economic outreach to Iran that then intensifies greatly after the coming to power of the National Socialists in Germany in 1933. But the man that brings Nazism to Iran is not Adolf Hitler or Josef Goebbels, but this man here, this is Hilmar Schacht. Looking, uh, <laughs> he always looks like he's on the attack. Actually, I feel like he's like an owl looking at a, a mouse. So Schacht, here's some details about him. Actually, the slides, there we go. There we go some information about Schacht. He was, he had been head of the currency commission during the Weimar Republic and had actually floated a new currency for Germany after the hyperinflation of 1923. He was president of the Reichsbank during the Weimar Republic when he was, believe it or not, a liberal. He then at the end of the 1920s makes his own turn to the right. And he then becomes president of the Nazi Reichsbank and the Reich Minister of Economics as you see here, he helps Hitler to build the dictatorship and to, uh, to rearm Germany in the, so after 1934, he is appointed Reich economics minister. 
in August of 1934, and then in September, he announces what was called his new plan. So shocked in the new plan are how Nazism in its biggest and most powerful form comes to Iran, and it will come in 1935 and 1936. So what is the new plan? Well, the new plan does a number of things. Inside of Germany, it centralizes industry behind the Nazi state, and it begins Germany's rearmament. It also finances the rearmament and keeps it out of the public eye because in 1934-35, this is uh, not that Germany is not supposed to be arming, but it is arming. It keeps it out of the public eye and it does this through the third point here on the slide, this reordering of international trade, which Schacht does in a very stealthy way. He reorders Germany's international trade connections and implements a radical new mechanism of economic exchange. And these are the clearing agreements. So here's Schacht marching next to Hitler. This is actually quite an appropriate picture because he helps Hitler to come to power. And then he, he helps enormously in the building of the dictatorship and the arming of it for war um, after 1934. So what are the clearing agreements? Well, clearing agreements do not have to be connected to war economies. In the 1950s, they are not, but in the 1930s, they certainly are. So at the outset with clearing agreements, they're absolutely connected to what uh, Schacht is doing in Germany. Schacht is put on trial uh, at Nuremberg by the International Military Tribunal. And this is a description of how the clearing agreements work that's taken from the indictment against Schacht from the IMT at Nuremberg, it described the clearing system as a sophisticated barter arrangement that exchanged raw materials for industrial technology. So as it stated, I'm just reading here from the slide, the importer makes a deposit of his purchase price, deposit of the purchase price in his own currency at the national clearing agency of his country which then places the same amount to the credit of the clearing agency of the exporting country. The latter institution then pays the exporter in his own currency. Thus, if trade between the two countries is unequal, the clearing agency of the one acquires a claim against the agency of the other." End of quote. And now as this, uh, in, as further on in the indictment, it talks about how Schacht uses this system as Germany's large, Germany is the largest economy to exploit the economies of any number of smaller countries and to then begin bringing money and materials for rearmament into Germany and keeping it out of the public eye. So this stealthy rearmament. Now, Germany at this time, Schacht is also disengaging the Nazi economy from what had been its largest trading partners. So disengaging it from the United States, from Great Britain and from France, and then setting up these new, this whole web of trade uh, agreements, these clearing agreements with industrializing countries. So as one analyst put it, Nazi Germany ran her foreign trade with countries, quote, which did not demand payment in foreign exchange, but accepted German goods instead. Germany without using currency could purchase raw materials and foodstuffs of military importance, end of quote. So this was depression era economics at its best. And for both sides, this was a vital aspect of the plan. There are no foreign currency transfers. Each country pays in its own currency and they can run, um, they can run balances and debits and credits against each other, which Germany certainly does. So by 1938, I'm moving to, there we go. By 1938, Schacht had signed a total of 25 clearing agreements with newly industrializing countries. So these included Turkey, Iran, and Afghanistan, China, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Bulgaria, Romania, Yugoslavia, and others. And kind of the Eurocentric focus of the literature on this, we know a lot about how these clearing agreements worked in the Balkan states, in Bulgaria, in Romania, and in Yugoslavia. But the agreements with Turkey and Iran are some of the earliest. Turkey is 1934, Iran is 1935, and they have numbers far beyond sort of the levels of trade 
that run between uh, Turkey and Nazi Germany, Iran and Nazi Germany are, are very interesting. So if you look further to the east, the, the story gets even more intense and interesting. Now this system funnels trade through state institutional channels, the central banks on each side and the trade organizations that are created to facilitate the transfer. So for Iran, this includes what was called the Iran Consortium of 1935. This was an organization founded in Berlin and also in Tehran a few days prior to the signing of the clearing agreement with Iran in October, 1935. Its members on the German side were Germany's huge coal and steel conglomerates together with uh, weapons firms and construction companies. And something like uh, the Vereinigte Stahlwerke, which is Germany's largest steel conglomerate in inside of this Iran consortium. So why would Iran sign on to this system? Because sign on, they certainly do. So you see the clearing agreement is signed in October, 1935. It's then ratified by the Majlis unanimously, I'd add in September, 1936. Shah then makes a state visit to Iran that I'll talk about in a moment. And then this memo that's given to finance minister Ali Akbar Davar then takes the clearing agreement and sort of massively expands it. So why, why does Iran sign on to the system? Because sign on, they certainly did. So what did the Nazi new order, Schacht's new plan, what did it offer to Iran? Well, it offered various political and economic things. Most importantly, it supported Reza Shah's project to industrialize Iran while simultaneously disengaging from Iran's largest trading partner, which was the Soviet Union. As Rola Ramazani wrote long ago, and I quote, the Shah made economic self-sufficiency by means of rapid industrialization, a cherished objective of his government. German capital and technical know-how were sought to further that goal. And German investment in and technical aid to Iran involved almost every branch of Iranian industry." End of quote. Or as Schacht himself put it to the guests at the official dinner during his state visit to Tehran in November 1936, and he said, and I quote, the fact that Germany produces everything that Iran needs and that Germany has an interest in Iran's raw materials brings our countries to the realization that for the benefit of both, a path must be found that simplifi simplifies the trading of goods and the modalities of payment, end of quote. Now the two countries were compatible in other ways as well. As the Shah told Schacht during their, they had a brief meeting in 1936. That's an interesting story as well because the, the Shah is not in Tehran, he's in Rasht and he makes, Shah, he makes Schacht come to him, which was symbolically important. And in that meeting, he said that quote, he counted on German participation in the country's rapid further development, end of quote. Now the two men shared a number of things. They shared a vision of the place of industry in an authoritarian state. They share ideas about the role of the state in controlling the economy. Schock's new plan in Germany came together with the crushing of the labor movement, the Nazification of the German trade unions into a state controlled labor organization, the silencing of the political opposition and a deep antipathy to the Soviet Union. So if Schacht's new plan was economically beneficial to Reza Shah's industrialization drive, the politics driving the new plan were also well suited to Reza Shah's new order, particularly the buildup of the Iranian state bureaucracy, the state control of foreign trade, the focus on the army and the crushing of labor organizations and political dissidents. Now, Schacht makes a visit to Iran. And this is the second row of pictures here. Here he is arriving for a few days. This was part of, it looked like a clearing agreements tour where Schacht and his officials had first gone to the Balkan states and then they go to Turkey and then they go to Iran in the fall of 1936. 
October 1935, the clearing agreement had been signed and then ratified. And in March 1935, Schacht had been made general plenipotentiary, general plenipotentiary for the Nazi war economy. So his new position uh, was most likely not known to his Iranian interlocutors. This was a secret appointment that he had, but it reveals Schacht's motives in really pushing forward this new relationship. The October 1935 clearing agreement sets out an exchange of millions of marks of German industrial goods that are to be exchanged for equally extensive orders of Iranian raw materials. So the report, the clearing, uh, excuse me, clearing agreement listed, and I'm quoting minerals and metals, nickel, copper, and others, cotton, wool, rice, and animal feed, oily fruits and seeds, soybeans, peanuts, castor oil seeds, cotton seed, jute, hides, and skins. And then the, these clearing agreements, they just have long lists of, of goods on each side. That's one of their aspects. It was clear that food shipments to Germany were a priority as were leather and hides. The leather and the hides were for the making of boots and shoes for the German military. Dried fruits and nuts were on these lists. And it was said that they were there for their concentrated nutritional values. So one can think that that was also to be uh, uh, funneled to the army as well. Now, during uh, Schacht's state visit in November, 1936, there is a memo. This is a memo exchanged during the Tehran visit, which is drafted by Schacht's uh, his um, colleague, the economic planner Helmut Voltat, and given to Iranian finance minister Ali Akbar Davar. Now, is this um, here? Uh, this is what it is. This memo exchanged during the Tehran visit envisioned a massive intensification. So we have the clearing agreement, and that's being sort of promoted here at this visit. But now it's going to be also expanded. So this memo envisions a massive intensification of the 1935 clearing agreement. So Iranian exports to Germany were to be expanded from the previous level of 80 million marks over four years to now 50 million marks in one single year and then a corresponding, so that sort of larger amount was then to go forward. So 50 million marks in, in 1937 and then the idea was then 50 million marks or even more 1938, 39 and and onwards. So in exchange, German firms are now going to receive contracts to build industrial facilities and infrastructure. So a network of medical clinics, a new Tehran hospital, a large scale irrigation system in Khuzestan, the modernization of ports and harbors, and the expansion of the road, rail, and air network, the latter via the Lufthansa firm. So the German drive to war was apparent, was apparent in this vastly enlarged scope of involvement. And in this memo, it's very clear what's going on because the memo starts with a mention of, the, of Nazi Germany's four-year plan of 1936, which was Nazism's program for war readiness. This mem memo envisions a virtual army of German experts descending on Iran to work with its administrators in the writing of reports, the generating of scientific studies and data, as it was said, quote, for the industrialization of Iran and an increase in the production of agricultural goods and raw materials, end of quote. So for example, the development of scientific agriculture, which is focusing on high volume food production, this was a central priority as was the possible development of a joint German-Iranian oil industry. Voltat's memo stated that, and I quote, Germany is interested in the earnings generated by Iranian petroleum and its byproducts. It would welcome the possibility if at a suitable time, Germany and Iran could take up the project of developing a national Iranian petroleum industry, drilling for oil, building refineries, pipelines, and storage facilities, end of quote. So German scientists are dispatched to report on the application of the latest fertilizers to Iranian agriculture. A whole, a whole lot of veterinarians arrive to modernize animal breeding. 
As the German minister in Tehran, a man named Hans Smend, he's there in 1935 and 36, as he had written, he wrote that it seemed that finance minister Davar, quote, had clearly decided to place the lion's share, the lion's, whoops, pardon me, lost my place, to place the lion's share of Iran's planned industrialization in German hands, end of quote. Now Davar commits suicide not too long after this, but his successor at the finance ministry, who is a man named Mahmoud Bader, who's known for being pro-German, as it was said, he showed himself to be a staunch defender of these arrangements. Now, between 1937 and 1939, the clearing system in Iran works tolerably well. Nazi trade officials report on various accomplishments. The, the munitions firm Krupp is investigating the possibility of mining copper. In Iran, German companies are shipping machinery for dredging the Anzali Harbor. But this relationship now is going to intensify even further. And it's going to do so because of this. And you probably know this picture. This is a famous picture. This is the signing of the Nazi Soviet Pact, the Ribbentrop Molotov Pact. This is a picture from the signing. This is Molotov sitting here, and this is Ribbentrop here. You see uh, Joseph Stalin. So the relationship between Germany and Iran, Nazi Germany in Iran, is going to intensify further. And after 1939 and the signing of this pact, Iran is going to be tied even more firmly to the, not just to Nazi Germany, but to the other pieces of Nazism's geopolitical system of attachment and exploitation. Because the Nazi Soviet pact creates an absolutely, absolutely enormous Nazi Soviet trade zone. Now we know the pact primarily as a political agreement. It is the famous non-aggression pact, as it was called, which partitioned Poland between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union and led to the Second World War. This political pact, however, sits on top of this. It sat on a large economic and commercial agreement, in fact, a clearing agreement that was signed between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. This is the signing of 19th of August, 1939. These are the trade officials. This man, Karl Schnurre, we'll see again in a second. He's on the Nazi, on the German side. This is a commercial and credit agreement, a clearing agreement, which exchanged 200 million marks of German military equipment for a corresponding amount of Soviet raw materials. And this provides the specific sort of the practical foundation for the political pact that comes four days later. So it's, this is a very perverse story because Germany, Nazi Germany and, and Stalin Soviet Union are essentially arming each other before they go to war with each other. It's, um, it's fascinating and disturbing. Um, the economic aspects of the pact are negotiated by Germany's Iran experts. So here we have Minister Schulenburg, here, this is Karl Schnurre, who was the man you saw signing the commercial, the clearing agreement. This is taken from uh, the German embassy in Moscow, where Schulenburg is now the German ambassador. And these two men, Schnurre and Schulenburg, are known as Iran experts in the German foreign ministry. They meet in Tehran in 1928. This is when their professional relationship starts, when Schulenburg is there as the minister and Schnurre arrives to, they draft the legal parameters for German industry in Iran after Reza Shah uh, removes the capitulation. So once that is gone, they are there in 1928 drafting the new legal framework and they work forward then from there. And these pictures are actually taken from Schnurre's memoir, these photographs, uh, his memoir is sitting in the, in the German foreign, in the, German, the archive of the German foreign office. So with the rise of the pact system, Iran is now repositioned vis-a-vis -vis both Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union and given a fiendish, fiendishly difficult balancing act to perform. Its industrial economy is dependent on German support roughly half of the total goods imported and exported. So the total, the total amount of imports coming into Iran is around, is, um, 
pardon me, German in, imports in 1941, German imports into Iran are 47.87% of the total and Iranian exports to Germany, so are 42.1% of goods exported. So between 40 and 50% of imports and exports for Iran are either going or coming from Germany. So the economy is dependent on German support, but Iran's politicians insist that Iran is not a Nazi puppet. Actually, the position that Iran has is there are very interesting parallels to what happens to Sweden later on, which I could talk about in the, in the discussion, if you like. But Iran, uh, they insist that, that they are not Nazi puppets and Iran officially declares neutrality in September 1939 as the Second World War ignites in Europe and tries to follow an independent course. There's some interesting ways how Iran defends its neutrality. For example, between January and April 1940, Iran refuses to allow French planes to use its airspace for an attack on Baku. Iran also refuses to allow Germany to ship weapons across Iranian territory. Munitions for the Iranian army are allowed, but there was to be no shipping of weapons to third parties. And Iran forbids the use of her petroleum and oil to aid the pro-Nazi coup d'etat of Rashid Ali against the British in Iraq in 1941. Iran closes no alliance with Germany and her politicians seek to maintain the country's independence in the face of this very intense Nazi and Soviet pressure. It's interesting, there's all kinds of documentation about the, the workings of, this, of these trade arrangements. And in them, you can see that Iran is also capable of pulling the chain, threatening then when shipments from Germany are flagging, threatening then to go to the Soviets. In October, 1939, Iran's cabinet ministers actually fiercely debate Iran's change situation due to the start of the war in Europe. And I can talk about that. I can go into that in the discussion um, if you like. Here, this is the Nazi journal Die Ostwirtschaft, the Eastern Economy. In the fall of 1939, the Nazi journal, this one here, is reporting on the functioning of this trade zone. See here, um, this is from October, November 1939, sort of extensive German Soviet uh, economic planning. And in this Nazi newspaper, there are all kinds of indications of all of the goods, not just the, the trade between Germany and Iran, but now all of the goods that are coming to Nazi Germany through the Soviet Union, this transit through the Soviet Union. And via German mediation, Iran and the Soviet Union sign a new commercial treaty themselves in April, 1940, which made Iran into a site of German so Soviet cooperation. And as a recent summary put it after 1939, quote, Iran became a significant transit corridor through which the Germans could safely transport important raw materials from Indonesia in Indochina for their military industries, end of quote. So as Iran is the Persian corridor for the allies, for the Lend-Lease program and for shipping weapons from the United States, to, uh, to the Soviets to fight at Stalingrad, that Persian corridor, before it's that one, it's this other one um, for all of these important raw materials from Indonesia and Indochina, then coming into, uh, coming through Iran and up into the Soviet Union into Nazi Germany. So with Schacht's new plan, and here I want to just sum up this portion, and then I have a brief portion on something, uh, the last part of my talk. With Schacht's new plan, the face of Nazism in Iran was that of these guys who we've just seen. My slide is a bit slow. There we go, that, who we just, this is the face of Nazism in Iran. These are the economic administrators who are putting together and running this immense system of administration, economics, transport, and trade that is mobilizing people, organizations, and networks toward a national socialist future. So the Nazi planners, these guys, this is the face of Nazism in Iran, or the, the, the biggest face. 
But what about Germany and Iran? So to go back to where I started, were those thousands of Germans in Iran, so estimates between 2,000 and 4,000, the New York Times is saying many of them have come here to assemble and install. This is German industrial machinery, et cetera. So were these thousands of Germans all connected in some way or another with Schacht's new plan? And the answer to that is no. There were not thousands of Nazi administrators in Iran. The thousands of Germany, thousands of Germans, pardon me, in the country were these people. Let's just take, there we go. They're refugees. The thousands of Germans in the country are refugees. Specifically, they're refugees from the Soviet Union. They're what, what are called Russland, Deutsche Russian Germans who began fleeing into Iran over its long border with the Soviet Union starting in 1928 and 1929. And they're coming mainly between 1929 and 1934, 35. So these are files, the, um, I have access to the old working archive of the German consulate in Tehran during the 1930s. And there are boxes and boxes of information on these people. And these pictures, these pictures come from the documents that Schulenborg, Schulenborg's the minister then, gives to them a kind of legal document that he gives to them that keeps them in the country so that they won't be deported back into, into the Soviet Union. Now, the earliest documented set of families was a group of 69 people who left the Caucasus, the, uh, the village of Marienbrunn in the Terek area of the Caucasus. They left in June 1928. They travel over the top of the Caspian Sea and then down through Turkmenistan and come into Iran around Mashhad. They leave their homes in the summer of 1928. A lot of them are fleeing for religious reasons. They are Lutherans, they are Mennonites. Some of them are, are Jews, German Jews. There are also German Jews from Germany who come to Iran. They are part of the refugee stream, um, but there are not as many, the, the thousands are these Russland Deutsche. I have a big database where I've been sort of going through all of this documentation, uh, who they are, how many there are, where they come from. When they're in Iran, they work mainly in agriculture. They also work in construction, particularly for the Trans-Iranian Railway. German minister von der Schulenburg gives them legal status. He also tries to help them emigrate further. Those who are Mennonite, international Mennonite organizations come in and fund their travel Further, the Mennonite families then go to Canada, uh, they go to South America. Schulenburg also is able to move some of these uh, families, the ones who are farmers. A number of them are coming from Ukraine that they've been defined as Kulaks, and so they are fleeing. The Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Russian Empire had large German diasporas in them. Um, and these uh, families are actually ethnically quite complex. Linguistically, they're complicated. Some of them speak German, others do not. Um, some of them, their Germanness is because they're Lutherans, et cetera. There are various marks of Germanness. Schulenborg defines them as Germans so as to keep them in the country because the papers they arrive with are Soviet papers, if they have any papers at all. And that obligates the Iranian government to deport them back into the Soviet Union. So I'm going to go very quickly through these slides. Here we go. Schulenborg gives them this here. This is one, one such document. This, as it says at the top, stands in for a passport. It gives, and it's one per family, which is why we have these pictures of families all together. He gives them this. This gives them a legal standing in Iran. It allows them to work. Uh, the German Foreign Office keeps lots of documentation. This is one such list of all of these refugees, sort of where, where they had come from uh, in the Soviet Union, the date that they left. This is one of the earlier lists that's more organized. As more and more people come, these lists become more and more sort of schematic. So these documents, when the Nazis come to power and they Nazify the foreign office, the four, the, the families, so they're this is a document from before, uh, before where they're 
shown as families. The Nazis then, after 1933, the, the vetting of these people then turns over to the Nazi party in Tehran. There's a small, has about 50 members, but a very vocal Nazi party in Tehran. They then vet the refugees. But this is, uh, these are some of the older documents of the, the families. This is a, these are some of the types of houses they lived in, in Iran working in agriculture. This was a, one of the companies, German companies in Tehran looking for work for one of the, the refugees. These are documents from, you see here, this is the Nazi party in Tehran. So vetting, they um, then vet the refugees. This is a, see here from 1936, where they're saying that they say that they are Aryans and to the best of their knowledge, none of their forebears are Jews. So this, all of this takes over after 1933. So this, these are, so the, the thousands of Germans in Iran are actually these refugees. By the spring of 1931, Schulenburg had issued documents to 220 families and kept issuing more. And I think it's actually very interesting how a whole number of them end up building the Trans-Iranian Railroad. So you have German engineers at the top and German companies and German money. And then in the labor force, you also have these Russland Deutsche, these Russian German refugees who work building the railroad. So these different faces of Germany and Iran and the different layers of this history are something that interests me a lot. Um, and all the various contexts and connections. But I'm going to end now. This is shot. I'm going to end with uh, sort of what happens to him. Actually, he's put on trial by the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. He is acquitted because um, in 1936, Hitler begins promoting Hermann Goering rather than Schacht. He thinks that Schacht is too much of a, a cosmopolitan. Um, is too international, so he's moving Schacht out. Schacht by 1939 has lost all of his positions. This, ironically enough, saves him at Nuremberg. He is one of the three who are acquitted. He's retried by German denazification court then and released on appeal. And in the 1950s, he's now an economic consultant to, as it is said, uh, industrializing and developing economies. So I want to end with a picture that I've seen and of, of an encounter that I want to know more about. And that's this here. So as you see, financial advisor Schacht, that's a very bare description of what he is. And I think the person who captioned this didn't know that I've learned that Mossadegh liked to receive people in his pajamas in, in bed. So I don't think he's ailing, but here that Schacht uh, this picture of Schacht and Mossadegh, that Schacht is invited to Iran. Sort of what were they talking about? That is something I definitely would like to know about. If any of you have any ideas about this, that, that would be wonderful to hear. Um, I thank you very much for your patience and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. This was such a fascinating talk. Uh... Uh, especially the kind of archival material you introduce here are so incredible and, and so novel for, to a lot of, you know, uh, scholars of Iranian studies, and I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, we have a number of questions, um, and uh, of course we can get together for my own questions uh, later. Um, uh, one question uh, is whether race played any part in uh, Iran and German relations. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, that was actually one of the things I was also thinking, what was the ideological connection there? Was there any ideological connection uh, on both sides, on the Iranian side, their conception of um, Aryanness and, and, uh, and the German side and, uh, so um, was there any kind of any sign of this kind of mm -hmm. ideological connection question of race between the two countries? Mm -hmm. um, that's an excellent question. I mean, for Nazi Germany, race plays a part in everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, race, there, every, when things are Nazified, they are racialized. 
Um, it does, it, it plays, there's, there's a complicated relationship on race between Nazi Germany and, and Iran. There is, one could say there's kind of this initial sort of celebration of a shared Iranianness, oh, Aryanness, Aryanness. But this, uh, this falls apart because for the Nazis, the Nazis have a very, you know, they take this, this older understanding of Aryan, um, where the Aryans are, are emigrating from east to west, the ancient Indo-Iranian tribes, the Aryans, because the Aryans was part of how world history was talked about in the 1920s. Uh, for example, that uh, the, the, the Aryan migrations it didn't necessarily have anything to do with national socialism. The Nazis take this term and they thoroughly Nazify it so that the other meanings of it fall away or, or are covered over or forgotten. For, so for the Nazis, the Aryans actually do not emigrate from India to sort of west to Iran. They actually immigrate north to south and they come from the Baltic. So they are Nordic. So the, the Nazi understanding of Aryan has this north to south immigration rather than an east to west. And the only Aryans, like if you read Arthur Rosenberg's uh, ideological writings on sort of Aryanness in world history, the, the only Aryans that he says are, the only Iranians he says are Aryans are actually the, the, the ancient Iranians. They're the Aryans, but none of the others. Mm -hmm. And the, Nazi, uh, the Nazis then talk about modern Iran as a kind of mongrel racial mixture of, a, of different peoples. So the ancient Iranians are the, this pure race and the modern Iranians are not. So the, this celebration of shared Aryanness quickly turns mm. into something else. There are many complications here. The, um, the archeologist Ernst Herzfeld, who was here at Princeton at the, at, at, after he flees from, um, from Iran and goes to Britain and then go, comes here to Princeton um, in the 1930s. Herzfeld is, um, he actually writes about modern Iran as Aryan. And the Nazis denounce him for this. Herzfeld is from a, um, a Jewish family. His father had converted to uh, Lutheranism, to Christianity, and Herzfeld himself on all of his official papers, like when he's a student and later on in the 1920s, he always defines himself as Evangelisch, which is Christian. And, and but his family, his family is Jewish. And so in the denunciation, file on Herzfeld, one of his own students who becomes the SS archeologist, Alexander Lambsdorff, who goes to Tibet on that SS expedition, Lambsdorff and Herzfeld's teachers and students write the denunciation file on him. It's really pretty, it's terrible. And they take his, his defining of modern Iran as Aryan as part of his, his degenerate Jewishness, that here is this Jewish man who is also is who is degenerate by being Jewish, and he has written a history of the Aryans, which is also degenerate. So they use Hertzfeld's talking about the Aryan roots of modern Iran, which he means in a nationalist way. Mm. Um, they use this against him, and and that denunciation file really shows kind of the complexities of a Nazi conception of Aryan. Um, uh, sort of scholarly conception of Aryan used by ancient historians, archeologists in the 1920s, and then Reza Shah's government's um, idea of Aryan. Mm. So they're not the same thing. Right, right, so fascinating. Uh, there's another question. Uh, you you uh, talked about basically two different um, groups of Germans being in Iran, uh, one those, uh, Ausland Deutsch from, from Russia, Soviet Union, and then the new people who come to basically work on Schacht's plan in Iran. And uh, was there a conscious effort to appropriate and incorporate those Ausland Deutsch people from Soviet Union into this project and, and make it sort of part of Schacht's plan in mm -hmm. Iran? And, and, and as you explained that, they issue legal documents and all uh, 
to those people? Was it a conscious sort of effort to bring those people to incorporate them into this uh, Shah's plan? Mm -hmm. um, some of them, I mean, it, it's, it's very interesting because the, the Germans, the heads of companies who come, um, a lot of them are, are that they um, support sort of Nazism's, so Nazism in Germany, the expansion of the Nazi economy, is sort of Nazi Germany in the world. There, we with with the the Germans who are who are coming with the with the companies and working for the companies, you find a more emphatic sort of eth, sort of a, a racial idea of Germanness and sort of an affiliation mm -hmm. with Nazism. Not all of them, but a, a lot of them. And then on the other side, the the Russland Deutsche, the Russian Germans, are ethnically very complex. And in fact, Sch uh, Schulenburg gives them a paper to sign that just says, I, I am German. And they sign this, the, the ones who are illiterate, there are a few that are illiterate, they just put in an, uh, an X. And he gets in trouble with the German foreign ministry in Berlin because they accuse him of just handing out some German status with both hands to these people who, whether they're German or not, who knows, or that the markers of Germanists are different and varied. Um, they, some of them, as that, that document from the Willi Schell firm um, was to try and get office work for one of the refugees, uh, Schulenburg is trying hard to find a way for them to economically support themselves. And they, and so he's emphasizing their Germanness. They get these documents that say that they are German. The, um, the heads of companies and sort of the engineers and the bankers and the financial people, the Germans who are there in Tehran sort of reach out to them and uh, raise money for them, give them food. They even like buy a cow, so there's milk for, mm. for the children, these sorts of things. They are described as fellow nationals in need, even though they're coming from like Tiflis, Tbilisi in Georgia before the First World War, um, was um, so I've seen uh, that it's sixty percent German. I don't know if that's true or not. But there are these. There's a big German diaspora through the Russian Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, Schulenburg, though, uh, a number of these families they were farmers in in the Russian Empire in the Soviet Union, and they are becoming rapidly more impoverished. There is this, and this is a very I've. I've Ann Stoller has written about this, mm. um, where you have this phenomenon of white Europeans or people who can pass as white Europeans who are impoverished. So there's this, Schulenburg was very aware that here are these Germans on display in Iran and they're very, very poor. They're, they're very poor. And there's this display of, you know, for the Nazis among them, and Schulenburg certainly supports Nazism and becomes kind of an arch Nazi. He later joins the, the, the plot against Hitler in July the 20th, 1944. And he's then hung in Berlin as one of the, those plotters, but he is definitely part of this whole Nazi machine. And uh, so the Nazis among them are going to say, look, here's, here's supposedly the master race, but they are very, very poor. And so Schulenburg is trying hard to either find them work or to, um, to help them to emigrate. And so it, as long as he has the money, this is where the international Mennonite organizations come in because they do have the money. And they, he says, if any international group will pay for the transport, we will help these people emigrate. And so the Mennonite groups are the ones that move mm. the biggest numbers of these Russian Germans out of Iran. Fantastic. One quick last question because we are almost out of time. Uh, was there any specific uh, linguistic project for Germans who sort of developed this relationship with Iran? Because as we know, uh, you know uh, languages and linguistic was a very big part of from very early on in 20th century in, in the construction of Aryan race. Uh, mm -hmm. Was there any specific project, uh, linguistic project uh, for uh, Germans establishing relations with Iranians or they really were not concerned with that at all? Well, that really belongs to the earlier period, certainly before 1914 and in, into the 1920s, this 
idea of Indo-Iranian linguistic groups, Indo-Iranian emigration, the relationship between modern German or sort of Indo-Iranian languages, there is definitely this linguistic connection, which is, is talked about a, a good deal. Um, by this period, though, what it, the linguistic connections, sort of a, a number of the, the heads of so the, the chairs of um, ancient religion or Iranian studies in Germany um, during this period, they're, they're really, that, those are the ones who are talking about Zoroaster as a Nordic shaman and, and things like that. They're, they're really doing very specific not, Nazi sort of corners of this or the pieces that the Nazis pick up and, and, and amplify this older discussion about Indo-Iranian languages and the connections between peoples belongs to the earlier period. So fantastic. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for this uh, incredible talk and, and conversation. And hopefully we can continue uh, these, um, uh, this dialogue. Uh, and, and again, as I said earlier, you're opening uh, a whole new door to the sort of these kind of colonial relations and through these kind of new archives and and uh, and uh, topics that uh, seldom have been discussed in the Iranian studies and you know transnational German history uh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and uh, and we hope that uh, uh, we uh, have this conversation more in the near future that, that would be great so thank you so much I and thank you everyone for coming Thank you so much. Goodbye.